Thanks so much for joining us here today. We look forward to worshiping with you. We're going to worship as we hear God's Word read to us. We're going to worship as we sing. And certainly we're going to worship as we hear Pastor Kyla share the message this morning. And, and Pastor Kyla will be carrying on with our theme, Life in a Good Place. Also, we need to remember that this week, a week from today, November 11, is Remembrance Day. And we know that um, we will have this opportunity as Canadians to remember all the sacrifices that have been made on our behalf over the years and how that's allowed us to have freedoms here in Canada. So as we start off our service, let's read a scripture together and then we'll join in prayer. So let's read from Psalm 100. It tells us about giving thanks to God, shouting for joy to Him, for all that we have, for the freedoms that we have. Let's read that. Psalm 100 says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Um, know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving, and His courts with praise. And give thanks to Him. Praise His name. For the Lord, the Lord, He is good, and His love, it endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. So God, thank you for that. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. We want to experience your goodness today. So God, we surrender ourselves to you to experience that. And we long for your goodness to shine through us that we can share it with others. So God, we just commit this time to you. Thank you that your presence is with us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks again for joining us today. We really hope that you enjoy yourself. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song. Of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear, I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Oh, from my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again. To your family, your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I I am a child of God. Oh, 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 you split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing, I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears are drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I can stand and sing. A child of God. Yes, I am 
a child of God. Yes, I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Hello church, my name is Pastor Becca and it's my privilege and joy to say hi and let you know the things that you need to know to be connecting with us in the coming weeks. The first thing is that if you're new here or if you've never done this before, we would encourage you to stay in touch with us by um, going to our website, victoriaalliance.ca and at the bottom of every page there's a, a little box that you can put your email address in. That signs you up for our newsletter, which goes out about once a week and just keeps you up to date about what's going on, ways to get involved. Um, another thing that goes out in the newsletter is our Connect card, which lets you take that next step. Um, maybe you want to get baptized, maybe you're interested in membership, maybe you um, want to get involved in a specific ministry or, or all those number of things. That Connect card it is the way for you to let us know that. Um, so when you do sign up, make sure you fill out that Connect card when you get your first newsletter and we would love to be in touch about how we can include you in our family. The second thing you need to know is that we're right in the middle of Operation Christmas Child season and this is a season where we as a church try to hit a certain number of boxes every year as a celebration of God's love in our community and around the world. So you can pick up boxes. We still have boxes at the church. You can pack boxes online. You can, um, yeah, bring those in uh, anytime, any time, any Sunday you can bring them. If you'd like to bring them during the week, please just give me a call or an email and we'll set up a time to drop off. I'm typically in the, in the office during the week, but uh, I run errands and I'm not always here. So I just want to make sure I am here when you come to drop off those boxes. The other thing that you should know about um, those boxes is part of the packing the box um, uh, process is that they ask that you include $10 with the box to help with shipping. Uh, something that you might not know is that you can do that online. You don't have to put cash or a check in the box. You can, um, I've put the link on our website. So if you go to victoriaalliance.ca, on the home page, there's a box that says uh, Operation Christmas Child. You can click on that. It's got all the instructions, when to bring them back, including a link to give your $10 for your box online. Um, they basically just collect all that, the online giving and the giving in the boxes, put it all in a big um, postage stamp slash fund. So you don't have to be anxious if, if putting something in the box is going to be inconvenient. You can do that online. And also please remember to do that as a part of your packing process. I know usually there's a pamphlet and we don't have that many this year. So just wanted to remind you of that. And thank you so much for participating in this together, church. We're going we're gonna to keep going for our 300 boxes and hopefully we will exceed that. Thank you so much for joining us for our service. And we're, I'm so looking forward to worshiping with you this morning. Hi, my name is Elijah and I wrote this poem. King Jesus, King Jesus, your name is holy. King Jesus, King Jesus, you are worthy. You died for our sins and rose again. You love us all. You made the world and us all. It is true. Thank you. Thank you. Go, Jesus. Hi, my name is Micaiah. I will be reading Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11 from the NIV translation. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, 
If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, said, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put your Lord God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and angels came and attended him. Well, good morning. I can still remember my second year of university. I was attending UBC Music School and I was living away from home for the first time, trying to find my way. I wasn't sure I would find friends that were as wonderful as the community I had left in Victoria, but there I was, one blustery November Saturday afternoon, standing with a group of my new UBC singer friends, waiting to see the newly released Disney film, The Little Mermaid. I clearly had found my people. <laughs> now, some keen folks may know that The Little Mermaid was based upon the 1837 Hans Christian Andersen tale, part of his collection, Fairy Tales Told for Children. What you may not know is that the companion fable released alongside The Little Mermaid went on to become one of Anderson's most famous of all fables. Translated into over a hundred languages, The Emperor's New Clothes tells the tale of a clothing-obsessed monarch who was swindled by two con artists into believing that they had made him new clothes so unique and marvelous that they were invisible to anyone who was either a fool or unworthy of their stature in life. In the end, while walking through the town displaying his new and decidedly absent clothing to the townsfolk, no one wanting to admit they couldn't see the hand-spun creations, the king is abruptly confronted by the truth when a young child, full of joyous wonder and innocent confidence, shouts boldly from the roadside, the king has no clothes! One might think at this point that the king runs for cover, realizing his total and humiliating exposure to the crowds. But Anderson writes that the king thought this procession or this deception has got to go on. So he walked more proudly than ever as his noblemen held high the train that wasn't there at all. The conclusion may seem unexpected, but in writing it so, Anderson clarifies for us all what it looks like to fully buy into a lie. So wrapped up is this unrobed man in maintaining his identity as a proud and deserving king that he would rather be naked, truly left to stand foolish and base in front of the entire town than have his position questioned. Hans Christian Andersen drew his source material from a much older version of this tale that circulated in India around the 1200s. The same swindlers are still weaving invisible clothing but in the original, they convinced the ruler that the material is so precious it's unable to be seen by anyone born illegitimately. Of course, the king could never risk admitting they were not of the legitimate bloodline. At the heart of both of these renderings, whether it be as a fool, a fraud, or a false heir, the folk tale reveals the way lies have great power anytime one's identity feels challenged or insecure. Knowing the truth of who we are is the antidote needed in a culture that is fully bought in to a false narrative. The king has no clothes. In a good place, these words can be safely proclaimed by those who know who they are and whose they are. We are continuing in our series called Life in a Good Place, and Pastor Rob and I have been basing our teaching outline on the book written by Scott McKnight and Laura Berenger, a church called Tove, now, tov is the Hebrew word for good or goodness, and if you haven't heard the other messages in the series, I'd really encourage you to visit our website and check out the message archive because we've been casting a vision of what it looks like to be a church where goodness is valued and nurtured. 
And we've learned that in a good place, we will see empathy fostered. We will receive and extend grace. We will champion people first. And today we'll discover that in a good place, one can freely declare the truth and reject false narratives. In a good place, we know who we are. We're good. We are God's beloved. We're sisters and brothers to one another. We're loved always. Our identity is secure in Jesus. We're blessed, chosen, held, and given for the glory of God. Our identification in Christ is enjoyed in a truth-telling culture. And in a truth-telling culture, we speak that identity over one another repeatedly. And deception ends. The scripture of this reading this morning tells us of the 40 days in the desert that Jesus spends fasting and praying, silent, and speaking truth back to the tempter's propositions. Some of us may be familiar with this part of Jesus' story. It's rich and filled with details that serve to reveal the nature of Jesus, the character of Jesus, the will of Jesus, and even the mission of Jesus. And I encourage you to read and reread this text throughout the week and let it spark you're wondering further as you consider it closer. But for this morning, I want to take a step back and actually see it in a much wider view. I wonder if we might together be able to observe the overall shape and movement of God's story and notice the importance of this interaction between Jesus and Satan, father of lies. In the story of our faith, there are some key pillars we know. In the beginning, God created the world, and as he stood back and enjoyed his creation, he spoke this word of blessing and commissioning over it all. Tov, meod, very good, perfect harmony, oneness with God, one another, and with creation. A shalom, goodness to the extreme. But then there was a lie. You can be like God, the liar spoke. And the humans, forgetting who they were and rejecting the goodness to the extreme God had provided, they believed the lie that there was more. So they thought to be more and to take more. Once certain that they were beloved of God, once so secure in that belovedness that they knew no shame, now they face the consequence of believing the deception of God's enemy and have struggled under the weight of shame and insecurity ever since. Thankfully, God has never given up on humanity. He has been pursuing us relentlessly, demonstrating his love and grace by providing ways for us to re-identify as his beloved. The law, a system for sacrifice and worship, dietary laws, holy days, circumcision, pillars of smoke and fire, prophetic words. The First Testament is filled with the stories of a God on mission to re-identify and restore his beloved as his beloved. God's on mission to restore Tov Meod. So enters Jesus. And what do we discover about his coming? He's come full of grace and full of truth. The antidote to the lie. Once grown, Jesus prepares for his ministry season with an act of surrender and obedience, and he's baptized by John. And this, this is where I'd actually like to pick up the Gospel account in Matthew. And I'm reading from chapter 3, just before our text from earlier this morning. Matthew 3, 16 reads, As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, and a voice from heaven said, This is is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. This is my son, identity, whom I love, security, with him I'm well pleased, validity. Heaven opened and Tov was already spilling out. It's this moment of identification, this is my son. That truth has the power to change everything. The scriptures continue, then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, is this routine sounding a little familiar to anyone? Because the story of humanity is being recapitulated in the person of Jesus. He's been identified as God's beloved son and is now off to face the father of lies in the desert. If Jesus, like humans, had been at all insecure in his identity, if he had been even for a second wondering of his belovedness, if he had wondered whether his mission was going to expose in him a weakness, if Jesus had believed the accuser's taunts, it would have been game over for all of us. 
but instead sure of his identity as God's son. Those words of affirmation from heaven still ringing in his ears. Jesus was ready for what he was to face. Verse three says the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. If you are who you say you are, if your identity is true, if you can trust that heavenly voice, if you are worthy of your stature, if, if it's such a small word, right? With the capability of imposing such enormous doubt and it's laden with the same doubt of the original lie. Did God really say not to eat this tree? Because if God really loved you, he wouldn't have said that, right? You see, the liar's game, it's not creative. It's not even complicated. It's a one note strategy to instill doubt in our belovedness. And so very often that predictable pattern works and seeds of doubt are well planted, but not in Jesus. Jesus knows the truth. He is the one fully qualified to proclaim, I am the truth. And Jesus has ushered into the world the antidote to deception. He's fully clear on his identity and so speaks truth back. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to a holy city and had him stand at the highest point of the temple. If you're the son of God, he said, throw yourself down. If you are who you think you are, then surely the angels are going to protect you and keep you from falling to the ground. Steadfast, Jesus speaks back again with the truth of scripture. And finally, Satan tries a final time to tempt Jesus to trade away the long path before him of pain and sorrow for a simpler and immediate fix. The lie essentially says, trade who you are for what I can give you. And again, Jesus, the word of God spoke truth. And in doing so, the scriptures confirm what he knew his mission was from the start. Truth causes the devil to flee. The cross was still a long way off, but I'm sure you could already hear the sounds of Tove echoing over creation again. And on the day of his resurrection, the women who carried the good news to the rest of the disciples had the pleasure of adding their voices to that song. Good news, Tove news, truth has won. Our identity as God's beloved is forever found as we identify with Jesus. Friends, in a good place, the words of God still ring and buzz in the air. Tov meod, one for you in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And in a good place, we practice the same outcome-altering work of reclaiming our identity in Jesus and speaking truth into the world. God alone is God. We are God's beloved. God's returned us to himself. This is good news. But what exactly does this look like in practice? What, what are the markers of a culture that nurtures truth-telling? How do we ensure we are a place where no one's left to discover they have no clothes on? Well, I wanna suggest three acts at work in a Tove truth-telling community. First, we're gonna to act to affirm one another's identity as beloved of God. Second, we're gonna to act to ruthlessly divest ourselves from the lies of the liar. And third, we're going to act in our dealings with one another to speak truth and then tell the truth. Let me explain what I mean. In a good place, we act to affirm one another's identity as beloved of God. You see, just moments after the first humans had walked with and enjoyed the company of God in the garden, they're quickly being led astray by the lie of the serpent. And along with the many theological implications of this occurrence, the one thing I really resonate with here is that as humans, we're pretty short uh, memory-wise when it comes to remembering who we are and whose we are. The act of affirming one another's belovedness is not only a necessary one-time event, it needs to be a perpetual activity. In her 2009 best-selling novel, The Help, author Catherine Stockett imagines a character who frequently speaks, nearly chance really, these words over a young girl in her care. You is kind, you is smart, you is important. And I often think of that scene. I imagine what it looks like to act in a way that affirms the belovedness of God in one another. When we greet a friend, speak the truth easily. When you bump into a stranger, speak the truth through your posture or your smile. When you engage with a newcomer or stand in the grocery lineup, 
greet a teen home late after curfew, or deal with a difficult coworker, look to be an agent of affirmation. You know, I remember several years back, I was working on a kid's ministry story outline, and the story was about a man Jesus encountered who had a crippled leg. The way this story was traditionally told left me thinking that we could maybe do better. So I reached out to my friend, some of you know him, Adam Bishop, to see if he might be willing to help me work through some of my wonderings. He was so patient with me and my ableist thinking that he gently encouraged me to see that the most important detail in the story was that Jesus was interacting with a person. That person faced some unique challenges, but was first and foremost a person, a person Jesus loved, full stop. You know, I've been so affected by Adam's gentle guidance that day and have worked hard, not just to police my language, but to widen my heart, to honor others better and to affirm their belovedness. You're beloved of God. Let that truth be the pulse of your living. And when we gather, when we enter the sanctuary and sing, when we lift up our prayers and raise our voice in song, don't miss the opportunity to add your voice to the good word God is humming over us. Be an ever-present reminder for one another, for we all too easily forget. You're beloved of God. Practice saying it as frequently as you utter hello. You're beloved of God. I'm actually serious. Say it with me. You are beloved of God. Now say it again. You are beloved of God. This becomes a sacred act when we are living in a good place. Second, in a good place, we act ruthlessly to divest ourselves from the lies of the liar. What lies have you fully bought into? What do you cling to in your resume that you see as valued above all? Like the king at the end of the child's fable, where are you still walking naked down the street simply because the deception must go on? Uh, It's usually that we're clinging to lies around areas of insecurity. So where are you still seeking approval? Where are you still pushing back shame? Where do you feel vulnerable to criticism? Pay attention. Whether it be our social status, education, ethnicity, family, gender, sexuality, age, ability, physical appearance, skill set, experience, religious training, salary, the list goes on. Whatever it is that you've woven into the fabric of your identity, there is unraveling work to do. And in a good place, people will do that work to make sure that nothing but Jesus is forming their identity. Because in Jesus, you're beloved of God. But I know it's not that easy to let go of the trappings of this world and the way that the liar has convinced you you could be more and have more. Yet under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, this work is important and ongoing in a good place. We learn that though we may have a university education, we identify as beloved. We discover that though we may have been hurt and betrayed, yet in Jesus we identify as beloved. Though proudly connected through traditions and customs of our ancestors, we identify as beloved. We unpack the baggage that comes in a hypersexualized world and we learn to dwell in a good place as we identify as God's beloved. Though we may have fallen prey to the liar who convinced us we're unworthy, that we can never be good enough, that we are the the wild child running with the wrong crowd, even the black sheep. In a good place, we reject the lies of the liar. We hear the affirmation instead of our faith community, and we lean into its truth. We act to identify only as beloved of God. Under the leadership of the Spirit, this work is possible when we live in a good place. Finally, in a good place, we act in our dealings with one another to speak truth and then tell truth. Speak truth and then tell the truth. This week in our staff meeting, we talked a bit about what this looks like in practice. Our discussion arose out of a reaction that someone had when I said I was speaking on truth. There was a shrug and a sigh and a, oh man, it can be so hard to tell the truth. And as we reflected together, we considered the accuracy of that response. It's difficult to tell the truth. And even more challenging still when telling the truth will change what others might think of us. 
Once again, when our identity feels insecure, truth-telling becomes near impossible. This is why, in a good place, we will foster the practice of speaking truth and then telling the truth. Let me explain. Speaking the truth is what we witness in Jesus' confrontation of the devil in the desert. Jesus speaks the true principles found in Scripture, naming them aloud. He speaks the truth because it defeats the liar and disarms his every attack. In the desert encounter, lie is confronted with truth. Lie is confronted with truth. Lie is confronted with truth. And then the liar departs. And what happens next? Jesus begins to proclaim the gospel, the good news. Jesus is making the Tov Mayod pronouncement. Jesus' time in the desert, it isn't a silent retreat or a rest before the battle. Jesus' time in the desert is the spiritual battle. Speaking truth changes everything. This is not just a poetic thing to say. It's a highly practical pattern for us all. Speak truth as you meet with conflict. Speak truth as you battle fear. Speak truth and do so until the liar is no longer there with a move. Then you'll find that telling the truth, though never easy, becomes gentler to all involved. The tensions are lessened. Emotion is met with compassion. When you know that I know that you're loved, and when I know that you know that I'm loved, when we come before each other secure in who we are and whose we are, telling the truth becomes an exercise through which we seek to understand and be understood in the absence of deception. Since my kids were very young, whenever they would find themselves upset, anxious, or facing something overwhelming, I'd move toward them and confidently say, let's speak some truth into this. And then we'd begin to speak truth. You're loved, always. Nothing will ever change that. This feels out of control, but you still get to control how you react. I can hear your concern. We have time to talk together. Now, what else is true? We go on to say you're safe right now. Your body is wonderfully made by God and will respond positively if you take some deep breaths. We can just sit here together for a while. I'm here, you're here, God is here. What else do we know to be true? And we'd continue in this manner until the panic passed, the liar departed, and we were left only with a story to share or a situation to ponder. In every case, Truth-telling finally came, and with it an opportunity for us to face truth together. Friends, I wonder, how different would the ending have been if Hans Christian Andersen's story took place in a Tove culture, where the king lived in a good place, where he knew he was beloved, and where he saw the belovedness of those in the crowd? Because I like to think when confronted with the truth, the king has no clothes, that in the community gathered round with compassion and began to offer words of affirmation, speaking truth to one another and celebrating with joy as the swindlers were forced to flee their town. I believe that the little child's voice would not just be saying the king has no clothes. I believe we might also hear the truth-telling voice say with great compassion, my friend, you are naked. Stop this needless procession. Come, let us clothe you. This is life in a good place. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, we welcome your presence with us, and we desire to hear you speak words of truth over us anew. Spirit, remind us of who we are and whose we are today. Spirit, place your finger on the things we are clinging to, the lies, the deception, our places of insecurity maybe, hurt, the places we have entangled our identity with half-truths. Spirit, place your finger there. Shine your light of truth that those lies would disperse. 
let your word of beloved fall on our ears again today. And God, we ask that you would work in our midst to continue working us into a good place. May we act as affirmers of one another's belovedness. May we act in ways that um, reject the lies we've bought into. And may we act in ways where we speak truth and then tell truth with great compassion and empathy for one another in the safety and the knowledge that we in Jesus stand secure. God, you're speaking to us on many levels today. Spirit, may your work be to open our ears well to hear true what is true. And not just to hear it, but to respond to it in ways that move us towards freedom to live out goodness. For your glory, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Lie number one, you're supposed to have it all together. When they ask how you're doing, just smile and tell them, never better. Lie number two, everybody's life is perfect except yours. So keep your messes and your wounds and your secrets safe with you behind closed doors. But truth be told, the truth is rarely told. I say I'm fine, yeah, I'm fine, oh, I'm fine, hey, I'm fine, but I'm not. I'm broken, and when it's out of control, I say it's under control, but it's not. And you know it, I don't know why it's so hard to admit it, when being honest is the only way to fix it. There's no failure, no fault, there's no sin you don't already know, so let the truth be told There's a sign on the door Says come as you are But I doubt it Cause if we lived like that was true Every Sunday morning pew would be crowded But didn't you say the church Should look more like a hospital a safe place for the sick, the sinner and the scarred and the prodigals like me. But truth be told, the truth is rarely told. Am I the only one who says I'm fine? Yeah, I'm fine. Oh, I'm fine. Hey, I'm fine. But I'm not. I'm broken. When it's out of control, I say it's under control, but it's not. And you know it, I don't know why it's so hard to admit it, when being honest is the only way to fix it. There's no failure, no fault, there's no sin you don't already know. So let the truth be told. Can I really stand here unashamed? Knowing that your love for me won't change God, if that's really true Then let the truth be told I say I'm fine, yeah, I'm fine Oh, I'm fine, hey, I'm fine But I'm not I'm broken And when it's out of control I say it's under control But it's not And you know it I don't know why it's so hard to admit it When being honest is the only way to fix it There's no failure, no fault, there's no sin you don't already know Yeah, I know There's no failure, no fault, there's no sin you don't already know So let the truth be told
Thanks for joining us this morning. It's always a pleasure for us to know that you're with us and connecting with us this way. Now, let's join together giving praise and honor to a God of love who has always been pursuing us, always been working, has relentlessly come after us, coming in Jesus, the one who's full of grace and truth, that we might be blessed to stand in the knowledge that we are beloved. To his name be all glory, honor, and praise. Amen. Have a wonderful week.